Medtronic Technologies impacted more than 72 million people in the last year, equating to two people every second. Harnessing the power of technology to take healthcare further, each technology has unique benefits designed to serve patients. The goal of this program is to get closer to the patient and delve into the challenges and impact of each technology in practice. This is the Medtronic MedEd Learning Experience. The Invos monitoring system should not be used as the sole basis for diagnosis or therapy and is intended only as an adjunct in patient assessment. Medtronic's medical education programs are offered to provide attendees education on the FDA cleared indications and use of our products when applicable. The contents and conclusions of the following program are solely those of the speakers unless otherwise noted. The speakers are responsible for all content and any necessary permissions. The speakers received funding from Covidian LP, a Medtronic company, for this speaking engagement. For this segment of the series, a discussion on the value of NEARS in clinical practice in the NICU, how is NEARS used in a routine monitoring paradigm? To help provide insight into these topics is Dr. Jonathan Mincer, NICU Well Baby Nursery Medical Director at Mountainside Medical Center. So what is monitoring? What is intensive care? Well, monitoring is uh, simple. It's the numbers we see on our screen. We look at heart rates, blood pressures, respiratory rates, pulse oximetry, uh, et cetera. Another form of monitoring is uh, serial lab testing, uh, blood gases, uh, complete blood counts or CBCs, and uh, serum chemistries as well. One of the forms of monitoring we engage in, and which relates particularly to pulse oximetry and to NEARS, is the oxygen delivery versus oxygen consumption, supply versus demand equation, or oxygenation adequacy is another way to think about that. Another way of thinking about our types of monitoring is monitoring that's proactive versus that which is reactive. Now, proactive monitoring is all, all the, uh, the forms of monitoring we do as safety measures to prevent um, tissue injury or prevent diseases from taking place. This is a form of monitoring before clinical sequelae with the goal of minimization of uh, tissue injury. Contrast that with reactive monitoring, which is picking up the pieces after they've already fallen, uh, giving a blood transfusion after anemia has already been discovered. So this is after clinical sequelae have already occurred and tissue injury is underway. We similarly seek to minimize tissue injury, but now we are in a situation of reactive monitoring where the damage supposedly has already been done. Another way of thinking about monitoring is non-invasive versus invasive. This is very straightforward. Non-invasive monitoring doesn't hurt. It's usually stickers on the skin, such as our current cardiopulmonary monitoring, pulse oximetry, and as we'll see, or see near infrared spectroscopy. Uh, contrast this with invasive monitoring, such as peripheral arterial blood pressure monitoring and our various laboratory measures, our serial blood draws, which we'll be talking about in some uh, detail moving forward. Okay, this um, cartoon over here is uh, probably the individual most important point that I'll be making during this talk because it underlies um, everything I'll be talking about as, as it relates to near-infrared spectroscopy and oxygen extraction monitoring uh, in particular. First, uh, our x-axis for now is oxygen delivery. And on the y-axis over here, I have oxygen utilization or consumption. Now here's the point is that over a range of oxygen delivery, as we start where it says normal metabolism and work our way to the left, we can see that oxygen utilization or consumption is relatively constant as we decrease oxygen delivery. However, we reach a point known as the, as the critical O2 point, which is the inflection line here. Changes in oxygen delivery decreases below the critical O2 point now result in effects on oxygen utilization. Stated another way, Oxygen utilization below the critical O2 point now becomes dependent on oxygen delivery, such that less oxygen delivery means less oxygen utilization at the tissue level. Now let's look at what that, what that looks like from an oxygen extraction point of view. I've now added that onto the y-axis here. Now again, in a state of normal metabolism, you can decrease oxygen delivery and notice a relatively stable oxygen extraction as seen here on the rightmost part of the graph. However, further decreases in oxygen delivery are associated with subtle increases in oxygen extraction. That is, until the critical O2 point is reached and further decreases in oxygen delivery will now result in extreme increases in oxygen extraction and a clinical picture of tissue metabolic failure or shock. So to summarize this, everything stays normal for a long time as you decrease oxygen delivery. Your oxygen utilization remains normal. Your oxygen extraction may show subtle increases. 
Once you surpass a critical O2 point, however, further oxygen utilization becomes dependent on oxygen delivery with increasing extraction to maintain tissue oxygen needs and a clinical appearance of a very sick patient. Okay? I'm going to come back to this graph several times. Now, what is near-infrared spectroscopy? Near-infrared spectroscopy NEARS, has an appearance very similar to pulse oximetry. It's a light-based oxygenation measure, but unlike pulse oximetry, there's no elimination of non-pulsatile flow. So you're looking at oxygenation of all blood flowing beneath the sensor. Now, that typically equates in any block of tissue in the body. The majority of blood contained within that block of tissue is venous, approximately 70 to 80%. We'll, we'll use 75% as our estimate, with the remainder being arterial and capillary. So when we look at NEARS, we're looking at a predominantly post-capillary signal. In other words, what is the venous oxygenation, capillary and venous oxygenation of the blood that's flowing beneath the sensor? That allows for regionalization. Remember, if we're looking mostly at a venous oxygenation, then the arterial signal is minimized within it. That means that you're looking at how much oxygen is left in that segment of tissue after that tissue has already extracted its tissue metabolic oxygen needs. Okay, so again, a predominantly post-capillary measure. Now, here's, here's a little cartoon that demonstrates what some of the normal numbers are for near-infrared spectroscopy measures in babies at different parts of the body. Now, if we look at our oxygen, oxyhemoglobin divided by total hemoglobin equation uh, shown at the top of the slide here is uh, exactly the same equation as is used in pulse oximetry. But just remember here that the number is venous. Therefore, it's going to be expected to be lower than what you would see in pulse oximetry. And sure enough, if you look at cerebral oxygenation, you get numbers about 70s, 80s, 80 percent, somewhere around there, and they're generally stable. If you look at renal, they're more variable and more widespread. I put here 50s to 90s. This is highly dependent on when you're actually looking at a baby. If you look at splanchnic, there's many variables that affect the, uh, the splanchnic utilization of oxygen. Think before a feed, after a feed. Is the baby stooling? Is the baby having a feeding intolerance, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a wide range of numbers seen here, and they are quite variable. Another form of monitoring, which we're looking into uh, a bit more um, recently, is peripheral muscle monitoring, or specifically uh, thigh, thigh muscle uh, monitoring, as a way of eliminating some of the variability that exists in the splanchnic, um, being, it, uh, an, being an, a closed cavity, whereas a, a peripheral muscle is a more um, a defined region of the body where you can be uh, looking at oxygenation measures. Now, moving forward here. If we know that pulse oximetry is a measure of arterial inflow, we can think of that in a way as oxygen supply to the tissues of our body. And remember, when you do pulse oximetry measurements, it's a pulsatile signal, therefore an arterial signal. Since arteries, by definition, have not passed through capillary beds yet, pulse oximetry provides a global measure of oxygen supply to the entire body. NEARS, on the other hand, like we said before, is regionalized. Since it's mostly a post-capillary measure, it's going to predominantly reflect what's left in the tissue after the tissue of interest has already extracted the oxygen it needs for its normal metabolic function. So using these two combined, they can be integrated into an equation called FTOE, which we'll be going into a lot of detail throughout this talk. That stands for fractional tissue oxygen extraction and represent, is represented in this equation here, where SpO2, pulse oximetry, represents supply, RSO2 represents demand indirectly. So the numerator of this equation is oxygen extraction. If you then put pulse oximetry in the denominator of this equation, you then get a fraction of the amount of oxygen that went in, what amount, what fraction of it has been extracted by the tissue. Now, if you look at these numbers, remember multiplying this by 100 would uh, turn it into a percentage, but I'm going to keep it as decimals for now. Cerebral demonstrates the least extraction of about 10 to 20 percent. Renal shows moderate extraction with a bit more variability, 10 to 30 percent. Splanchnic shows the most extraction between 30 to 40 and even higher uh, percentages, sometimes less, sometimes higher. Now, what's interesting here is that these numbers do make sense when you consider the blood supply to these organs. The cerebral has a double blood supply. It has the, the anterior and posterior circulations. Compare that to the renal, which has the renal arteries. Compare that to splanchnic, which also does have a form of a double blood supply, but is, um, again, much more affected by physiological processes such as feeding that, um, that are going to affect our, our oxygen extraction numbers.
So this is our equation of fractional tissue oxygen extraction, which we're going to be seeing a lot of in the upcoming studies I'll be presenting today. Okay, now let's look at some of the, the research that has gone on. One of the biggest questions that have exi has existed for the past two and a half decades when it comes to NIRS monitoring is, what do we expect to see on the screen? What are the normal numbers and how do we expect those numbers to behave? Fortunately, there's been some work that has taken place in this regard. So normative and variability studies describe what are the expected ranges for individual organ monitoring, whether looking at the brain, the kidney, the gut, how do these numbers change over time and what is the expected signal behavior if you're standing at the bedside and you're uh, observing the monitor as, uh, as this monitoring is taking place. So this was one of the earliest studies, the McNeil study, which is uh, notorious in its design because it provided some of the earliest information and is one of the most well-referenced studies in the uh, NIRS literature in, in the newborn population. What you see here in these three graphs are cerebral, renal, and abdominal measures for the first three weeks of life. The blue uh, diamonds in each graph represents a 29 to 30 week population, and the, uh, the orange colored squares represent 32 to 33 weeks. Now, if you look in the upper left, cerebral demonstrates high numbers, and they're fairly tight with, without that much variability. If you look at renal, they demonstrate very similar numbers to cerebral, at least in this study. Now, again, at the bottom, if you look at, at Splanknik, you're going to notice that the numbers are much lower and much more variable. Look at the error bars. They're, uh, they're quite variable from, one, um, uh, from each uh, data point to the next. Now, what's interesting here is that the numbers are shown to change over the first three weeks of life, and this is replicated in further studies that cerebral and renal in particular start up as high numbers and gently drift down over time, supposedly as the brain and the kidneys start utilizing more oxygen in the first few days of life. Now, one caveat in this study is that this data represents one single data point per day, okay? It's one averaged data point representing 24 hours worth of data. Now, knowing what we know today, that NIRS represents oxygen utilization on the tissue level, and knowing that that's a, a factor that changes over time. Think of the Splanknik. You feed, you don't feed. You're stooling, you're not stooling. Think of the brain. You're either awake or asleep, etc. It's very difficult to, to average this amount of data all into a single data point, but that's what was done at the time of this study uh, done about 10 years ago now. This is another uh, very important study from the Alder Liston group in the, in the Netherlands um, that, uh, this is Petra Lemmers' group actually, that looked at normative data among almost a thousand babies, 999 babies, for cerebral, for babies between 24 and 31 weeks gestational age during the first 72 postnatal hours. If you look at these graphs, you see 24 to 25 weeks in the upper left, upper right is 26 to 27 weeks, and the other gestational ages are in the bottom two curves there. Integrating all this data, there's now a generally accepted range of 55 to 85% now used for cerebral clinical studies in this population in the first week of life or so. These are the numbers that are actually being used as the normative values in the SafeBoost series of trials, which I encourage uh, anyone to look into. It's been some interesting work in the use of uh, near-infrared spectroscopy in the first uh, couple days of life in that, uh, in that population. Please tune in next week for a new segment from this series wherever you find your podcast. This is the Medtronic MedEd Learning Experience. Thank you for listening.